Good morning, everybody. It's good to be with you on this beautiful Lord's Day. Please have your Bible open to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. We'll begin there in just a moment. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. And if you have a bookmarker, please place it there. We're going to be turning away a couple of times, but turning back to that particular chapter. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. If you're visiting with us, thank you so much for being here. You are um, invited back anytime that you have the opportunity. And if you have any questions about what we say or do here, uh, please ask those questions after services. We would love to get to know you and give an answer for what we do. Do you know how to tell a false prophet? It's interesting that the Old Testament gives a couple of litmus tests of who is a false prophet. That if a prophecy comes about, then that person is a true prophet. But even that wasn't the only litmus test of the Old Testament about who is a true and false prophet. The book of Deuteronomy says, even if the prophecy comes true, but if that prophet is telling you to go after other gods, if he is in disagreement with previous revelation, then that man is a false prophet. But when Jesus is speaking on the Sermon on the Mount, it's interesting that he doesn't reference back to that litmus test, although those are still good litmus tests. Jesus says, you will know a false prophet by the way they live. He says twice, you will know them by their fruits. You can talk a good game for a while, but the true colors of a person, of that prophet, will be shown through. And it's interesting that as the Apostle Paul was under a great deal of scrutiny in the New Testament, what he often points about himself is his manner of life, his fruits, if you will. Look at how I've been living. Look at how I conducted myself while I was among this city or these brethren. And such is the case here in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Paul is under a great deal of, of scrutiny. And he brings up his integrity in verses 12 and 13 of 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Our boast is this, the testimony of our conscience, that we behaved in the world with simplicity and godly sincerity, not by earthly wisdom, but by the grace of God, and supremely so toward you. Look at our body of work. We behaved ourselves in holiness or simplicity. We behaved ourselves in godly sincerity. We were preaching not by earthly wisdom, but by the grace of God. This is our body of work. And you know this because we acted like this supremely so toward you. And then in verse 13, he brings up his straightforwardness. That's a mark of the Apostle Paul. For we are not writing to you anything other than what you read and acknowledge. I love that statement. I'm not politicking here. I'm not posturing. There's no hidden message in this letter. What I'm, a, what I'm writing is exactly what you can read right off of this scroll. That's what Paul was writing. Well, this begs the question, why was he bringing up his integrity? Is his apostleship under attack? And it was, although he's not really talking about the defense of his apostleship in this part of the letter. He'll do that later on. But the reason why he's bringing up his faithfulness and integrity and straightforwardness is because he's anticipating some detractors of calling his integrity into question. You see, what's going on is this. Paul had meant to come through Corinth and changed his plans on purpose. He meant to come through Corinth on the way to Macedonia, and that didn't come to pass. He had a gospel meeting scheduled in Corinth, we might say in the 21st century language, but he canceled that meeting for different reasons. He says in chapter 2, verse 12, or actually go back to chapter 1, verse 15, he'll say what his plans were. Because I was sure of this, I wanted to come to you first so that you might have a second experience of grace. Here's the plan in verse 16. I wanted to visit you on my way to Macedonia and come back to you from Macedonia and have you send me on my way to Judea. That was the plan. Go through Corinth on the way to Macedonia. But in chapter 2, verse 12 and 13, he says, I've arrived at Macedonia. And he didn't make this pit stop in Corinth. Chapter 2, verse 12, When I came to Troas to preach the gospel of Christ, even though a door was open for, for me in the Lord, my spirit was not at rest because I did not find my brother Titus there, so I took leave of them 
and went on to Macedonia. He's in Macedonia now. He didn't make that scheduled stop. And he is at least anticipating people in Corinth calling his integrity into question. Well, did he ever plan on being here anyway? Look at verse 17 of chapter 1. He says, Was I vacillating when I wanted to do this? Do I make plans according to the flesh, ready to say yes, yes, and no, no, at the same time? Was I pulling your leg? Was I purposely pulling your leg and never planning on coming to Corinth? And the answer is an emphatic no. I wasn't pulling anyone's leg. Look at verse 18. As surely as God is faithful, our word to you has not been yes and no. But Paul did cancel his plans on purpose. And he sent Titus there as like a go-between and in-between to get a report of how the Corinthians were doing. And when he didn't get that report back from Titus, he says, I went on to Macedonia. And then the reason is given later on why he didn't go there. If you drop down to the end of the chapter, in verse 23, he says, I call God to witness against me. It was to spare you that I refrained from coming to Corinth. Verse 1 of chapter 2 says, For I made up my mind not to make another painful visit. Paul didn't want to make a painful visit. He didn't want to show up with a rod. So he sent Titus to get a report. And when he didn't get that report, he made this decision to cancel his plans in love. I did not want to make a painful visit. Well, going back to verse 18, as surely as God is faithful, he says, our plans were not yes and no. And then beginning in verse 19, Paul does something that I can't stand about preachers, but I love about the Apostle Paul. He takes a rabbit trail. I know I take my own rabbit trails from time to time, quite a few of them actually. I don't really like to listen to rabbit trails. Oftentimes they're not really connected and they never come back to the sermon and the rabbit trail becomes the sermon in and of itself. But I love Paul's rabbit trails. They are Holy Spirit inspired rabbit trails. And oftentimes the greatest meat is what he does in those little rabbit trails. What he's about to do is convert from talking about his own integrity to God's integrity. You say, well, I don't get it. Why is he talking about God's integrity when it was the Apostle Paul's integrity that was in question? And that leads me to my first main point. What Paul will say is this. We are honest. We have integrity. We are faithful because that's the way God is. That's the way God is in Christ. Look at verse 19. Here, begun, here, here begins the rabbit trail. For the Son of God... Wait a minute. The Son of God isn't the, the, the question at hand. It, it's your integrity. But listen to this. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, whom we proclaimed among you, Sylvanus, Timothy, and I, was not yes and no, but in Him it is always yes. The Son of God is not dishonest. That's, the way, that's not the way that He's preached. God is not honest. God is not dishonest. And so that's the way we are. That's the way we preach Christ. Honesty is Godlike, brethren, and we need to be promise keepers. Right down to the point where it hurts. If we make promises, we need to come through on those things. You ever made a promise before and a week later or or maybe even years later sometimes you think, "Man, I, I wish I hadn't made such a strong promise." But we need to come through with those, even when it hurts, because that is a God-like characteristic. That is a Christ-like characteristic. And dishonesty, on the other hand, is devilish. You remember what Jesus said in John chapter 8 about lies and Satan? That Satan is the father of all lies. And he told those Jews in John chapter 8, your father is the devil because you believe a lie. Anyone telling lies, believing lies, their father is Satan. He's the father of all of it. But let's go one step further. The characteristics that we could emulate or that we should emulate all go back to the fact that they are characteristics of God. This is not just true of honesty. We're not just supposed to be honest because God is honest. But we are to use that motive as a reason for all of the characteristics that we strive for. Go to this passage that's on the board now. 2 Corinthians Chapter 2 and verse 14. 
Thanks be to God, who in Christ always leads us in triumphal procession and through us spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of Him everywhere. Through you. What God is doing is He is spreading the knowledge of Himself through you and through me. And you might ask, well, how is God doing that? And somebody might say, well, God is doing that through preaching. That's not the point of the text. What he's about to say in verse 15 is that God is revealing himself in you by you being like Christ. Look at verse 15. For we are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing, to one a fragrance from death to death, to the other a fragrance from life to life. Here's the point. As you are imitating Christ, God is revealing Himself to the world. We sing a song, and we sang it not too long ago, I think the Sunday night that Brian Sheely preached. We are the world's Bible. Yes. If there was ever a book, chapter, and verse that went along with that song, it is this one right here. As the world sees you being like Christ, God is revealing Himself. Fragrance. Do you smell like Christ? I mean, not literally, of course. But do you smell like Christ? And if you do, the world, in a sense, is seeing God and coming to know God. So it's not just true of honesty. We're not just supposed to be honest because God is honest, but we are supposed to emulate all of Christ's characteristics. As He was compassionate, we need to have compassion. As he was forgiving, we need to forgive. As he loved, we need to love. As he stood for truth unwaveringly, we need to stand for truth. And the world will get to know God. Well, how is God so faithful? How is he coming through on so many promises and so trustworthy? What Paul is going to say now is a, is a little bit farther on the rabbit trail. The reason why God is so faithful in Jesus Christ is because Christ is where all the promises of God find their yes. Look back at verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 20. He says, For all the promises of God find their yes in Him. You ever thought about all the promises of God in regards to salvation from the Old and New Testament? I, I haven't counted them, and I, I don't know if anybody has counted them. But it would be a remarkable thing to just kind of put them on paper, type them all out, all the promises of God in regards to salvation, and they were all made true. They find their yes in Christ. Isn't that amazing? Doesn't that boggle your mind? The seed promised to Abraham that in his seed all the nations of the earth would be blessed. That's a yes in Christ. The promise to David that one of his descendants would always sit on his throne, that is a, a yes in Christ. The promise to Moses that a prophet would arise just like him or like him. And to him shall the obedience of the peoples be. That's a yes in Christ. The promise of intercession, judgment, forgiveness, redemption. They are all found in one person. The Son of God, Jesus Christ. And then he transitions. He's still on the rabbit trail now. He goes from God's integrity to how God is being so faithful in the fact that He's fulfilling all of these promises in Jesus Christ. And then He transitions into something about prayer and how we say our amen. Still in verse 20, chapter 1, verse 20, all the promises of God find their yes in Him, and then this. That is why it is through Him that we utter our amen to God for His glory. You can say amen in the name of Jesus Christ because Christ is where all promises are found. Now I understand that he might not be talking about just prayer. We say amen sometimes in the middle of a sermon. We say amen at the end of songs sometimes. But I just want to make this application to prayer. This is why, he says, we can say our amen in the name of Jesus Christ because that's where all the promises of God find their yes. Let's talk about this term amen for a moment. 
Is there anything about prayer that we talk about less than the end of our prayers? In Jesus' name, amen. We zip it out, don't we? You should hear my son Judah pray. In Jesus' name, amen. He zips it out there a million miles a minute. You know why? He has no idea what he's saying. He has no idea what in Jesus Christ, amen, means. And sometimes, I wonder if we adult Christians know what it means. Do you know what it means? To say amen in the name of Jesus Christ? If you look up the definition of the word amen, you will inevitably find the definition of let it be, or so be it. Let it be in the name of Jesus Christ. So be this prayer in the name of Jesus Christ. Let this prayer for the sick, let this prayer for the elders, for the lost, my, my kids, my marriage, let this prayer be in His name. And yet, if you do a little bit of research about the word amen, I don't think the definition of let it be is as strong as it needs to be. Let me, let me just tell you what I found. The word amen is a transliterated word. Every time you see the word amen, it is transliterated. Now, there are translated words, and then there are transliterated words. Here's the difference. If a translator comes across a Greek word like agape, we've talked about that word before, he says in his mind, the translator, okay, is there an English equivalent to this word, which is translated love, right? Transliterated words are words in the Greek that we don't necessarily have any equivalents to. And so what the translators do is they transliterate it. They might change a vowel or add a consonant. Let me give you a couple of examples. Christ. Christ is a transliterated word. In the Greek, Christon. Transliterated, Christ. Baptize is a transliterated word. I wish they had translated it to immerse or submerge or plunge, but they transliterated baptizo into baptize. You see what I'm saying? Every time you see the word amen, it is transliterated. But here's what's interesting. It's not just a transliterated word into English. It was not a Greek word at all. It was transliterated into the Greek from the Hebrew. That is where the word amen finds its roots. And if you do some research about the Hebrew amen, guess what the definition is? Truth. Truth. Sometimes it is translated. You remember when Jesus said, truly, truly? He said that many times. But like to Nicodemus in John chapter 3, truly, truly, I say to you, one must be born of water and the Spirit to enter the kingdom of God. Guess what that word is? Amen. Amen. It means truth. Turn in your Bibles. Place that marker there in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and turn in your Bibles to Isaiah 65. I know if you're not interested in word studies, they, this may seem a little boring, but I'm leading up to a very powerful point, I think, in regards to prayer. So follow me. Isaiah 65, verse 16. This time, the Hebrew will be translated, not transliterated. But here in Isaiah 65, verse 16, the text says, So that he who blesses himself in the land shall bless himself by the God of... It's translated truth, but that word is amen. The God of amen. The God who tells the truth or is truly true. Go in your Bibles, please, to Revelation chapter 3. Did you know that one of the words of Jesus Christ, or one of the names of Christ, is Amen? This time, it wasn't translated, it was transliterated. Here we are in Revelation chapter 3, beginning verse 14, if you will. And to the angel of the church in Laodicea write, The words of the Amen. The words of the truth. Well, isn't it interesting that Jesus said about himself, I am the truth. The words of the Amen. Here's what I'm leading up to. I think the definition in its original language, Hebrew, is a lot stronger than just let it be. 
What we are essentially saying, when we say at the end of our prayers, in the name of Jesus Christ, amen, we are saying this is the truth. It is almost as if our prayers are signed, sealed, and delivered. We believe them to be truth. Why? Because they're in the name of Jesus Christ where all promises are fulfilled. Someone might say, well, how can a person be so confident that their prayers are, are, are truth? And what they're asking for will become true. I'll tell you why we can be so confident. Because it's in the name of Christ. <laughs> the question shouldn't be, why, why could a person be so confident? The question should be, why aren't we this confident? Why aren't we that confident in prayer? That we could say at the end, this is the truth in Jesus. So when you zip that line out at the end of your prayers, I challenge you, don't just zip it out with empty repetition or tradition or not meaning something. It is a power-packed term. You can say that in Jesus Christ. And it's to God's glory. Now, going further on the rabbit trail here, he's not only going to say, Paul, he's not only going to say that all promises are fulfilled in Christ, but he's going to say four of the things that happen in Christ. He establishes us, he anoints us, he seals us, and it is there that he gives us his spirit as a guarantee. Look back at 1 Corinthians chapter, chapter 1. Flip back there, please. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. And begin reading in verse 21. And it is God who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us and who has put his seal on us and given us his spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. Just quickly, a, a few points or points uh, or singular point about these four things. He establishes us. Did you know that that's present tense in the original? It's not past tense, like He established you at your baptism. He is establishing you, present tense, in Jesus Christ. And that's where He anoints. There is a, there's a little bit of a word play in the Greek that I find interesting. He anoints. You know that this is the word for Christ, anointed? The way it sounds in the Greek is that He Christs us in Christ. Now, He doesn't Christ you. He doesn't anoint you with the same power and dominion and authority as what Christ has. I know that, and you know that too. But if you go back to the Old Testament and you study who is anointed, it was priests and kings, royalty and priests. Isn't it interesting that Peter says in 1 Peter that we are a what? Royal priesthood. The people that were anointed. He Christs us in Christ. And He puts His seal on us. It's a mark of ownership, this seal is. I had the opportunity recently to see Jason Amalong's cows. And you know what they do on cows? They brand them. They brand them. It's a sign of ownership. And we went down to the local feed store, and they have all of these brands listed and who they belong to, what person each brand is. You know what God has done in you or with you? He's branded you. He's put His mark of ownership on you. In Jesus Christ, He's not ashamed of you. That is, if you're living like Christ and striving to be His and striving to be like His Son. He owns you and has put His seal on you. And He's given us His Spirit as a deposit, as payment, a guarantee. You know, you don't do anything in the business world without some form of deposit or payment. You can't even get a taco at the Taco Bell without paying first. The pay window comes first, then you get your taco. You don't do anything without full payment or deposit. And God has given us that courtesy. He's given His Spirit. That's His deposit until we gain our full inheritance. The rabbit trail is over and so is the sermon. Please get out your songbooks and turn to the song of invitation. I hope you enjoyed Paul's rabbit trail. One more thing about the 
the second chapter reading that we did there in verses 14 and 15, 2 Corinthians 2, 14 and 15, that passage mentioned about a, a triumphal procession. How Christ is leading us in a victory pr parade, if you will. A triumphal procession. What's interesting about that is that that's what Roman guards did and Roman armies did. They would have triumphal processions. They would go down into a city and conquer it and subdue it if they were not paying their taxes or whatever. And then they would lead back to Rome this triumphal victory parade. There is a historical document from, from, from 61 A.D., about the general Pompey leading a triumphal procession. They would give Pompey a scepter and a crown and a purple robe, and it was quite the victory parade. Well, what's also interesting about those victory parades is that they would have these pagan priests offer incense, fragrance. Isn't it interesting that Paul mentions fragrance in connection with a victory parade. Well, that incense, as you watch this Roman parade go back to Rome, it would mean either one of two things to you. Victory, if you were on the side of Rome, or defeat. And Paul says the same thing about the aroma of Christ. That it is either a sign of salvation or it is a sign that you are lost. The fragrance smells like death or life. So I ask you about these Christians. What does it smell like when you're around Christians? Do you like that smell? You like being here? You like being around people that are like Christ? Does it smell like life? Or does it bother you? Does it remind you that you're lost? I think that's a sign. Whether you like being here and like being around other Christians. And if you don't, please think seriously about your eternal salvation or the lack thereof. The waters of baptism are prepared. You can put on Christ and be put into Christ where God will take all your sins away this very day. Please come, as together we stand and sing.